I care deeply about the environment, which is why I work in the mining industry. Do you think that makes me a hypocrite? Because a lot of people do, and I'm getting fed up of it. We're facing the biggest environmental threat in generations in climate change. And to combat it, we need low carbon technologies. To make these low carbon technologies, we actually need to mine more raw materials than we ever have done in the past. So surely we need people who actually care about the environment to be leading the charge on this. I'm a geologist by training. I did my undergraduate in earth sciences at Oxford University, and then I did a master's in mining geology at the Camborne School of Mines. And these degrees have really given me a toolkit to start to understand the physical world around me and to give me the opportunity to be part of the solution to combating climate change. So let's start with a little bit of word association. I was involved in a public outreach event recently, and we did this exact exercise. If I say the words mining to you, what words and images pop into your mind? At this outreach event, we got answers such as wasteful, dirty, dangerous, fossil fuels, and bad for the environment. We also got pole dark, but that's kind of inevitable these days. So how does this all change when I say renewable energy to you? What words and images pop into your head? At this same outreach event, we got answers such as wind turbines, solar panels, necessary for combating climate change and green. All of these are really valid answers. But I think you'll agree with me that on the whole, the associations with mining are pretty negative, whereas the associations with renewable energy are pretty positive. But my question to you is, how do we make these solar panels? How do we make these wind turbines, if not by extracting the raw materials that they're made up out of from the ground? At the start of my master's, the lecturer put this phrase up on the board. And it seems obvious when you think about it, but at the time, it really made me sit up and think. If something hasn't been grown, then it has to have been mined. Everything we use in our day-to-day -day lives has either been grown or it's been extracted from the ground. If we're driving along the motorway and we leave at a junction, there's not a handy hill that just happened to be there where the junction was. That's been built up out of aggregate. The road we're driving on has been mined. The car we're driving in, all of the metals that make that up have been extracted from somewhere. Even the mobile phone in your pocket has, on average, two-thirds of the elements from the periodic table within your mobile phone. Just think of the suite of mines that they must have come from around the world, and what's the impact on the environment for that? It's time we started to change this conversation. There's such a disconnect in society between what we're actually consuming and where it's coming from. The raw materials that we use do have an impact on the environment. Even low carbon technologies are going to have a serious impact on the environment. So things like your wind turbines and your solar panels, they're made out of a whole suite of metals that actually we haven't necessarily used that much in the past. And to put quite how resource intensive this energy transition is going to be into context, let's, for example, look at a wind turbine. And before that, just to give you one little stat to start you thinking, over the last 5,000 years, humanity has extracted about 550 million tonnes of copper, which is a lot. We need to extract that in the next 25 years to meet this demand from low carbon technologies, copper wiring. But there's also a growing middle class of people around the world in places like India, China and Africa. And as people have more disposable income, they aspire to having things like brick built houses, laptops, mobile phones, and maybe even driving electric cars in the future. And who are we to deny them that right? And this huge increase in demand for raw materials means that recycling the raw materials that are already in circulation simply cannot meet that demand. So we need to think about how we're sourcing these things responsibly and where they're actually coming from. Your average three megawatt wind turbine has just under five tons of copper wiring in it two tonnes of rare earth elements and is made up out of 1,200 tonnes of concrete. And that's just one wind turbine. Everything we consume in our daily lives has an impact. And, you know, this negative connotation with the mining industry, we really need to change the conversation. We use these things, so we need to start thinking about how we can source them in an environmentally responsible way. So where do you think that's more likely to happen? In places like Europe, 
where mines would have high, high environmental standards, companies are held to account for their actions and workers are paid fairly, or in places like the DRC or parts of South America where actually local communities can have very little say in what's happening and environmental standards can be much lower. Surely it's better to have these mines in a place where we can actually keep a good eye on them. What if I was to stand here today and to announce that there's going to be a brand new mine opening two miles from your house? What would be your gut reaction? I bet most of us would fall pretty firmly into the NIMBY camp, not in my backyard. Think of the environmental destruction, think of the disruption to our lives. It'd be dreadful. But in Europe, we've got a huge demand for these natural resources. But we haven't really got any mining here at the moment. There's some. But it's not because we don't have the natural resources. It's because we've got this not in my backyard attitude. We've been outsourcing our problems to other parts of the world for decades. So why should we start to change now? But actually in Europe, this demand for raw materials is huge and it's growing. So let's have a look in a bit more detail at something like the car industry. Audi, BMW, Jaguar Land Rover, Nissan, you name it. They've got a factory producing cars in Europe and it's really important to our economy. And as we move away from an environment where we have cars with combustion engines that are burning fossil fuels, we're going to transition to electric cars. And all of these factories are also going to transition to producing electric cars. Even Tesla are building a mega factory, most likely to be in Germany. And to support that, I think there's currently 10 battery mega factories that are either in production or planned to be in production over the next few years, which is great. But where are they sourcing their raw materials from? Let's have a little look at lithium, because it's a world that I know a bit more about. The first lithium-ion battery was actually commercialized in 1991. And if you want something that's lightweight, portable, and can store charge, then a lithium-ion battery is a pretty good bet. So it's used in mobile phones, it's used in laptops, and it's actually used in electric cars and grid storage of energy as well. So the World Bank estimates that our demand for lithium is going to increase 965% from 2017 production levels of about 43,000 tonnes, increasing 965% to about 415,000 tonnes by 2050. That's huge. And as we transition to electric cars, it's really causing this step change in global demand for lithium. But where does that lithium currently come from? Let's have a possible journey for the lithium that might be in your electric car. At the moment, a lot of the world's lithium is either produced from hard rock in places like Australia, so that's your more kind of traditional mining, or you get it in brines in South America. And these brines that form in South America form in really arid places, such as the Atacama Desert, and in places like Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. What companies will do, they'll come in, they'll find areas that are prospective for these lithium brines, They'll put boreholes down beneath the surface to intercept these kind of salty fluids just beneath the surface. They're often no more than 200 meters deep. And they'll pump them up to the top where they enter into evaporation ponds. And these evaporation ponds have been dug out of the salt flats. And although that's a huge kind of, you know, capital output, once the water's in these evaporation ponds, it just, over about 18 months, the water evaporates off and it gets saltier and saltier and saltier until... It's a really lithium-enriched solution. But just to give you an idea of scale, from the front of that picture to the pond at the back is about five kilometers. So these things have got a huge environmental footprint. And actually, although it's relying on solar evaporation to concentrate the water, which, you know, is pretty green, over 80% of the water that's pumped up to the surface from these salty brines is lost to the atmosphere through evaporation. And in water-sensitive areas, such as the Atacama Desert, this has huge environmental ramifications that local communities are really starting to suffer from now. But that aside, we've had 18 months of evaporating off our water. Uh, it then enters into a processing plant on site where it will get made into something like lithium carbonate. What happens next? Well, actually, more likely than not, we ship it over to China to refine it into battery-grade lithium chemicals. We might then ship it to Korea to put it into a battery for an electric car. And then we might ship it back to Europe, to the UK, to be put into an electric vehicle. I read a stat the other day that actually the average electric car at the moment 
the lithium in its batteries travels 50,000 kilometers before the car has even driven a single mile. That's a hell of a carbon footprint, and that's just for one of the elements within it. If we can localize the production of the lithium, for example, that the electric car in Europe industry needs, there's the opportunity to reduce the carbon footprint of that, that one element that's being used in it by less than to less than 10% of what it currently is. So there's an increasing environmental argument to start localizing the production of the raw materials that we're actually consuming. In Cornwall, we actually have huge natural capital. We've got this rich mining heritage, and actually we've got a hell of a lot of potential to produce some of these metals that the battery industry requires and that we need to help combat climate change. At Cornish Lithium, where I work, we're focused on exploring for lithium contained within the geothermal waters that circulate at depth beneath the county. And ultimately, what we want to do is put boreholes into about a kilometre's depth, pump these fluids up to the surface, where they'll enter a plant where the lithium will be directly extracted from the water. So instead of relying on these evaporation ponds, A, it's a lot more efficient, so it's hours rather than months, and B, we can't rely on evaporation in Cornwall. But, <laughs> if only. Um, but it just shows that responsible mining is possible. And actually, responsible mining has the chance to contribute positively to 17, all 17 of the sustainable development goals. But responsible really is the key word here. The mining industry historically has an awful reputation, which in parts of the world it definitely deserves. But overall, the industry is actually less worse for the environment than the fashion industry currently is. But it's still far too variable. So take cobalt, for example. It's another vital component of a lithium-ion battery. But you can't send an email. You can't check social media. You can't drive an electric car. You can't go on holiday on a plane without using cobalt. But over the last few years, the DRC, the not-so-democratic Republic of Congo, has produced about 65% of the world's world's cobalt. So there's a really high chance that the cobalt in your mobile phone has come from this area with all of its associated problems of conflict, slave labor, children involved in the mining industry. So think of the outrage when we realized that the UK government was shipping our recycling out to Malaysia rather than dealing with it ourselves. Is claiming ignorance really an excuse to not take responsibility for what we're consuming? We need to change this conversation about mining. We need low carbon technologies and there's a growing middle class of people around the world. Who are we to deny them the right to aspire to brick built houses, mobile phones and driving cars? We really need to change the conversation about mining and start to take responsibility for how we extract these materials. I care about the environment, which is why I work in the mining industry. Do you still think I'm a hypocrite? Thank you. <laughs>